This episode is brought to you by Black Butler, parody of the Phantom Hives, a Black Butler abridged series slash parody. And by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground, coming in early 2021. Thank you. Bailiff, bring forth the offender. stock of the 2019 holiday movie season, it was a byword among music theater aficionados for the worst excesses of the 1980s mega musical era, an all-spectacle, no-substance show that wore out its welcome with everyone but the most undiscriminating of tourists. Yet, it enjoyed a record-breaking run and a fan base that endures to this day, and honestly, I can see why. Its interesting concept and simple story, told primarily through dance and movement, makes it accessible across language and age barriers. Of all the silly fluff shows, it is the silliest and fluffiest. Pun not intended. Yet that simplicity also made it a tough piece to translate to film, especially 20 years past its prime. And Andrew Lloyd Webber choosing Tom Hooper, a man known primarily for his awards bait drama to direct, was not the kind of thing to inspire confidence. The baffled reaction to the first trailer was enough to make Universal give up on the movie right then and there, and the finished product created a stir for all the wrong reasons, as social media feeds blew up with people trying to figure out what the here was up with this film. Why was this a thing? CGI monstrosities. Everyone looks like alien naked people. You all want to commit suicide? Um, what the fridge was he thinking? Explain to me how a bunch of people. cats came Why? together and a fight Do the cat not break out? What the hell is this? Male. There's nothing to denote on any of the cats' designs that they're actual cats. Like, I'm not here to see celebrities dressed up or mutated as cats. I want to see freaking cats. I know cats. Look at this this beautiful you. I know what they're like when they're all looking at each other. They hiss at each other and then transfer each other's (laughs) eyes. This is why I am a dog person. Right? Those who are familiar with the stage show know that to a certain extent, Cats is just like that. But there are many, many places where the movie adaptation either makes existing issues worse or adds entirely new ones to perplex the viewer. And why have I been here for 100 cases if not to tell you in detail exactly what those issues are? So, at long last, let's examine the case of Cats. During the overture, which lets us know right off that Lloyd Webber has not updated his orchestrations at all since 1982, an unseen person steps out of a car and chucks a creepily wriggling bag over the wall of a junkyard. This gets the attention of the local cat people, who immediately begin circling said bag like they're about to murder or have sex with whatever is inside. This will be the mood most of the characters will give off for the remainder of the movie. This is Victoria, an abandoned kitten and our POV character who is instantly put under the third degree by her fellow felines. When you fall on your head, do you land on your feet? Are you tense when you sense there's a storm in the air? Right, there are two overriding problems with this movie, and we should discuss them before we get too much further into this. The first is the choice of director. In retrospect, I've come to the conclusion that Tom Hooper's early success had a lot to do with his choice of material. Both The King's Speech and Les Miserables featured personal dramas set against the backdrop of grim historical events, and this, coupled with charismatic performances from the cast, allowed him to pass off his mistakes as conscious creative choices. He doesn't have that leeway with Cats, which is an extremely stylized and fantastical show that runs right into Hooper's commitment to realism, often to the point of literalism. This becomes apparent right off, as random objects appear on screen just because they happen to be mentioned in the lyrics. 
The origin of cats is in poetry, with all the figurative and imaginative language that implies, but Hooper is a very prosaic director, which was also a huge factor in Sin Number no. 2, the notoriously appalling special effects, and more specifically, how exactly they came to be that way. Perhaps the biggest conundrum of translating cats to screen is the design of the characters. On stage, the performers aren't cats so much as they are an abstraction of catness. They have stylized wigs and makeup, patterned leotards with furry accents, and their movement, especially in Gillian Lynn's original choreography, is meant to evoke the way felines move rather than faithfully represent it. This works in a stage musical because the audience is used to filling in the blanks themselves. But film is a much more unforgiving and literal medium, and the attempt to translate the cat-like humans from stage to screen took a headlong dive right into the uncanny valley. This was made worse by the slapdash, unfinished look of the film, which resulted in things like random changes in proportion, elements clipping or floating above the floor, and shots looking half-finished. And the worst part is, it didn't have to be that way at all. Cooper's unsuitability for an effects-heavy movie was evident right from the start when he refused to allow the actors to wear mocap suits on the grounds that it would interfere with their performances. Tell that to Andy Serkis. He was also reportedly awful to the effects team, constantly treating them in a demeaning and condescending manner and criticizing play blasts because he didn't understand that they were representations of work in progress rather than completed shots. Things got worse when the trailer dropped. Remember when I mentioned Universal pulled funding from the film as a result of negative reception? That resulted in the same team that had worked for six months to make that 90-second trailer getting four months to complete the rest of the hour and 45-minute movie. Staff were working 80 to 90 hour weeks, often sleeping in their offices, and the print was only finished on 8 a.m. of the day of the premiere. I don't care if you have weighted digital on your payroll, nobody is turning in high-quality work under those conditions. So, in short, the special effects staff were expected to work under conditions that could not possibly produce their best work and got thrown under the bus when the results were predictably less than ideal. That alone is enough to condemn this movie to hear fire, and we've hardly gotten to the actual film yet. Victoria has run into a colony of semi-feral cats that call themselves Jellicles. Among them are Mr. Mistopheles, the magical cat, McCavity, the evil cat, Strap, the exposition cat, and a couple of mean girl cats who I'm sure have names, but I'm not bothering with them because this case is already threatening to tie my forked tongue into knots. Cat got your tongue? Oh yeah, sin number three for including every possible bad cat pun you can think of in the script. I would guess most cats in Victoria's position would run away and find a nice bush or car to hide under at this point, but she's intrigued by the weird mix of horny and creepy that is going on, so Monkett Strap explains the closest thing this insanity has to a plot. Jellical cats meet once a year at the Jellical Ball where we all rejoice, and the Jellical leader will soon appear and make what is known the Jellical Chores. Here's the non-sung version. Basically, the Jellical Cats are having their annual get-together, which will culminate in one of them being chosen to ascend to the Heaviside Lair, which is like Cat Heaven or Cat Reincarnation or I don't know. If you want insights into feline theology, you've come to the wrong place. How will they be chosen? By singing the song of themselves, of course. And there you have it. This is basically the feline version of a chorus line, only infinitely more weird. Also, if this makes the Jellicles sound like some kind of death cult, there is very little in this movie that will disabuse you of that notion. It happens the sun is shining bright, you would say we have nothing to do at all. Resting and saving ourselves to be right for the Jellicle moon and the Jellicle ball. Monka Strap offers to show Victoria, one of the Jellicle contestants, a house cat named Jenny Any Dots, who, oh, sweet Lucifer. Enter Rebel Wilson as sin number four. Jenny Any Dots' thing is that she sleeps a lot during the day, but at night she teaches etiquette to the household vermin. On stage, she's kind of a sweet motherly character, but Wilson's performance adds a lot of unwelcome, crass humor. And that's before the part where she unzips her skin to dance with the creepy mouse children and the showgirl cockroaches. No, 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 
go past this, past this part. In fact, never play this again. Wilson's singing also leaves a lot to be desired. She has a flat timbre and her voice lacks expression. And she's responsible for the vast majority of the aforementioned terrible cat wordplay. Don't mess with the crazy cat lady. Ah! That particularly nightmarish sequence is cut off by the arrival of Rum Tum Tugger, a sexy tomcat who is very horny even for this movie, which is to say that he is extremely uncomfortably horny. Victoria! Tugger scampers off, but not before hissing at a sad-looking cat in a fur coat. It's best not to think about it. This is Grizabella, who was kicked out of the Jellicles for vague reasons having to do with Macavity, and now she's an outcast and the Mean Girl cats sing Mean Girl songs at her. Grizabella the Glamour Cat Grizabella the Glamour Cat Oh no, something terrible is... Oh, never mind, it's just James Corden. No, wait, that's much worse. Oh no, look what the cat dragged in. Oh, shut up, Rebel! Luckily, McCavity poofs her out of the movie, as Corden is quite bad enough on his own to warrant sin number five. He plays Bustopher Jones, a cat whose personality trait is that he's fat and loves to eat. Which, fine, this was written in the 1930s, and besides, who doesn't love a big chonk? But this results in a lot of Corden rolling around in garbage and indulging in weight jokes, which ends up being unfunny and gross. Look at you and look at me, and you know, you know that I'm sensitive about my size, okay? And yet you embarrass me, you... <laughs> That's what I say to you. <laughs> McCavity snatches up Bustopher too, causing the rest of the cats to scatter and Victoria to fall into the hands of twin troublemaker cats Mungo Jerry and Rumpelteaser who are sin number six, or more accurately, their song is. When writing the music for Cats, Lloyd Webber wrote two tunes for this particular poem. If you've seen the stage show where it's 1998 Pro Shot, you're likely familiar with the second, and in my opinion, superior melody, which alternates a jaunty music hall style A section with an irregular time B section. This is in keeping with Elliot's description of the character's penchant for both charm and chaos. And saying a voice that is broken with sorrow I'm afraid you must wait and have dinner tomorrow The joint has gone from the oven like that But demonstrating his chronic inability to leave well enough alone Lloyd Webber switched in the first music for this movie Which has much less variety in character If the area window is found ajar And the bedroom looks like a field of ore If a tile or two comes loose on the roof Which presently fails to be waterproof also, I don't want to constantly harp on the special effects because we've already established what a shit show that was, but the irregular proportions in the scene are making my horns ache. Victoria's jewelry looks larger than it should be, the food looks smaller, and the props on the table are all over the place. All of this crashing around alerts the household dog, and Victoria gets caught up trying to escape. Mungo and Rumple leave her hanging, probably because, like me, they really really do not want to see what this universe's version of a dog looks like. Fortunately, Mistopheles comes in and helps her escape before that becomes an issue, and takes Victoria to witness the arrival of the Jellicle leader, Old Deuteronomy. Meanwhile, we catch up with the above-the-title stars who are currently held captive on a river barge. You caught me on a barge in the middle of the Thames? I'm supposed to be going to the ball! Oh no, you're not going anywhere, puss and sp See, McCavity is determined to get to the heavyside layer and looks to increase his odds by imprisoning the competition. Killing them would seem to be a more direct solution, but in spite of the fact everyone in this movie looks about ready to jump the bones of everybody else, it's still PG. Anyway, McCavity leaves his prisoners under the guard of the mangy ship's cat, Growl Tiger. From Gravesend up to Oxford, I pursue my evil aims. Rejoicing in my title of the terror of the Thames. Right, no, see, that doesn't rhyme. James, you are in no position to be criticizing T.S. Eliot's rhyme schemes. Also, Eliot did devote an entire poem to Growl Tiger, but there's some racial stuff in there that did not age well, and the stage production... Then King gets gave the signal to his fierce Mongolian horde. 
Yeah, it didn't help much. Anyway, let's go back on land where Monk and Strap is singing Old Deuteronomy's praises. Old Deuteronomy's lived a long time. She's a cat who has lived many lives in succession. Give Robbie Fairchild credit, he is 100% committed to this playing a cat thing, and as a result manages to be one of the few actors to emerge from this mess with some kind of dignity intact. Speaking of dignity, let's have a big round of applause for Dame Judi Dench! <laughs> so, now that old Deuteronomy is here, we can get on with this Jellicle choice... choosing. But first, Cat Orgy! Victoria pops out for a breath of non-horny air and finds Grizabella outside the theater performing the musical's signature song. Every street lamp seems to beat a fatalistic warning. Let's be real, Jennifer Hudson has exactly one job in this movie, which is to perform a kick-ass rendition of memory, and she does it. It's not necessarily Oscar material, but she wouldn't disgrace a stage version. Unfortunately, her performance here is followed up by the official award bait song, Beautiful Ghosts, which is about, oh, I don't know, finding your home or coping with the past or whatever. All I know is that Francesca Hayward doesn't have near enough oomph for a Lloyd Webber power anthem, even a third tier one. All that I wanted was to be wanted. So, the bad news is we've come to another point in the movie when what can charitably be called the plot more or less stops so we can watch some more Jellicle auditions. The good news is that the next three numbers are some of the better ones in the movie, even going so far as to be unironically entertaining in places. First up is Gus the Theater Cat, which is just Ian McKellen coming out and being Ian McKellen for five minutes. And if someone will give me a toothful of gin, I will tell how I once played a part in East Lynn. But hey, that's not a bad thing, and Old Deuteronomy approves. Albeit in a rather unorthodox manner. <laughs> anyway, Sir Ian has better places to be, so McCavity whisks him away. Next we have Skimble Shanks, a trained cat whose song is an absolute bop, and who is played by Stephen McRae, who is blessed with some fantastic tap skills and also the most fabulous set of whiskers in the movie. About the only thing wrong here is Hooper not being very good at filming choreography. point, McCavity is done being sneaky and levitates Skimbleshanks off in front of everybody, possibly because he knows stiff competition when he sees it. Besides, it's time for his big number, assisted by Taylor Swift and an extraordinary amount of glittery catnip. McCavity's a ginger cat. He's very tall and thin. You would know him if you saw him, for his eyes are sunken in. I'm just glad this movie has finally admitted what a drug trip it is. McCavity, whose closeless appearance is making me think everyone who's fantasized about seeing Idris Elba nude got their wish granted by a cursed monkey's paw, insists on being named the Jellicle Choice by virtue of being the last cat standing. And to be fair, he did have a bitchin' number. But Deuteronomy refuses, as she judges cats based on what's in their soul and not on production values. McCavity doesn't take kindly to that and poofs her off to the barge, forcing her to walk the plank if she doesn't grant him heavy side layer privileges. Which... couldn't he have done that from the start? For all this talk of him being a criminal mastermind, he does make a lot of basic villain errors. Back in the theater, everyone is coming down from their catnip high and realizing they need to do something to rescue their matriarch. But none of them have any experience with magic. Well, with... One exception. You're a magician. What? The pressure is making Mistopheles extremely anxious, so the other cats decide to boost his confidence, how else, with a song and sin number seven, Mr. Mistopheles. 
This is one of those Lloyd Webber songs that gets tedious after about the umpteenth chorus, but it's always been something of a guilty pleasure of mine because the brisk pace and featured dance turn make it fun on stage. The movie, meanwhile, slows the tempo to an absolute crawl, so you feel every agonizing moment of this song. Especially as Mistopheles' failed attempts to poof old Deuteronomy back drag things out even more. <laughs> didn't work. Maybe we should sing some more? <laughs> Finally, after about the 50th chorus, Old Deuteronomy returns, and we get another six choruses in celebration. Meanwhile, things are falling apart for McCavity, as his other captives use their <laughs> talents to free themselves and force Growl Tiger into the drink. And yes, Virginia, there is a hairball joke in this movie. <laughs> Victoria sees Grizabella lurking around the edges of the theater again and urges her inside because she knows Grizabella has one thing the other cats don't have, a grandstanding 11 o'clock number. Deuteronomy chooses Grizabella with much of that oddly sexual head rubbing that's been happening throughout the movie, and the latter ascends to the heaviside layer via a prop left over from that last failed Lloyd Webber film adaptation. McCavity makes one last attempt to stow away, but it doesn't go as planned. I think McCavity's evil genius credentials were severely oversold. Anyway, dawn is breaking, and it's all over but the epilogue. But, oh, what a bizarre epilogue. You've heard of several kinds of cats, and my opinion now is that... This song, The Addressing of Cats, obviously works a lot better on stage where the extended fourth wall break is... How shall I put this? Considerably less uncomfortable. At least Monk and Strap's overly enthusiastic reactions are a useful distraction from Judy Dench's eyes boring into your soul. Some potted grouse or salmon paste. He's sure to have his personal taste. As the rest of the cats scarper off, Old Deuteronomy welcomes Victoria into the fold, meaning she has a full year to work on a creepy ass production number for the next ball. is a movie best experienced with a group of your snarkiest friends and copious amounts of your favorite controlled substance. It's not good, but it's interesting, if mostly in a train wreck way, which makes it great bad movie night material. Still, the process of making it was a nightmare, and the main reasons for that are Tom Hooper and, by extension, Andrew Lloyd Webber for hiring him so they are condemned to be eternally tormented by Uncanny Valley cat people and also by all the special effects staff they screwed over. So let it be recorded. This very special session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>